great pleasure, actually, to introduce um, our plenary speaker, Dr. Joan Rose, who is the Homer Nolan Chair in Water Research at Michigan State University. She's also the co-director of both the Center for uh, Water Sciences and the Center for Advancing Microbial Risk Assessment. And um, just so you know, I, um, it's my pleasure to introduce her because I've known her for a long time, since the early 1980s. Um, and and uh, have followed her substantial and sustained um, contributions to our knowledge and understanding of water and health risks over the years. I could tell you a lot of stories about Joan, but we probably should save them for another time so we won't go there. Um, but Joan has been involved in terms of science in uh, investigating uh, numerous waterborne outbreaks and, and water uh, disasters worldwide. Her work addresses the use of new molecular tools for surveying and mapping water pollution for recreational and, and drinking water, the assessment of innovative water treatment technologies for developed and developing uh, countries, the evaluation of wastewater reuse systems and the application of quantitative microbial risk assessment. And I have it on good authority that the book for which she's a co-author on QMRA, a very popular and famous book, will soon be out in a second edition. So coming soon to a, uh, a, 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 an Amazon site or another bookstore site near you. Uh, this morning, Joan is going to be discussing her recent work on, on metagenomics and the, and the, and the virome in, in the environment, particularly the aquatic environment, as it applies to water and, and sewage and, and other kinds of exposure sources, uh, food included. Um, and then after she speaks, we'll have a few <coughs> minutes for, for questions. There'll be microphones, as you see, um, on the sides. And we ask that you would um, um, say who you are and, and where you're from. Um, and with that, I uh, would like to in invite Joan to the podium. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here. And I know now Chuck Haas can come out of his office since the proofs for the QMRA book <laughs> are done. Um, anyway, I'd like to thank uh, Rachel Noble, Jamie Bartram, Jill Stewart, and the organizers, uh, Marissa, for all the, the help. And uh, this has been great fun. I love to just come in to uh, such a, a meeting where you just get to talk about uh, microbiology. So. Um, when Rachel asked me about uh, giving a keynote, I thought, well, I'll, I'll present some of the new work that's going on um, in collaboration with a number of scientists at, at MSU. And leading this effort is uh, Tiang Ah, and, and Dr. Ah is a, uh, um, a research assistant um, at uh, Michigan State University and comes from Singapore. Um, and is affiliated uh, in the past with NTU and in U.S. and Singapore as an environmental virologist. And he's really leading this effort in uh, linking with the people that are looking at uh, the interface between this new technology, the traditional environmental virology, and the bioinformatics, because that's where we need to go. Okay, so you all know this. We're in the Anthropocene era, and there's a lot of stresses uh, on the uh, system. Um, and some of them are listed here. But our question in, in this era is um, how is water quality changing and probably where is it changing? Um, how does this affect human health? And how can new technology help us with water exploration and discovery for decision making in the future? I think it's really interesting that this morning on the news uh, there's a lot of talk about the climate change and how climate change is really starting to affect the weather on the ground and that you overlay these land use changes and our community and social changes with climate. Does that uh, mean that we're in trouble here? And maybe I'm preaching to the choir, but um, I'm going to suggest to you that water resources and coastal systems, both marine and freshwater, are degrading. Are degrading over time despite our efforts at um, improved management, improved policy, and improved uh, infrastructure. So why do I say that? Well, I think if we look, about, uh, look at our coastline, we know that um, around both our freshwater and coastal coastlines, that's where the population lives. 
and uh, there is quite a bit of data, particularly if you just look at nutrients and that type of thing, that uh, our waterways are heavily polluted. These, uh, the 10 longest rivers in the world, it's suggested that 5 billion people are at risk in terms of their security. And um, I like this because John and Jonathan Patz, who's been looking at climate and health for quite a long time, has talked about the great acceleration. And I like this because it puts things into perspective in terms of time. So we know about population. And what, what, what I want to point out is right around the 50s, and here's population, right? Um, we start to see um, a, a more rapid increase of population. And of course, there's different predictions. But along with that, water withdrawal, no surprise. But that means water return because most of water withdrawals come back as used water return to the environment. So we've got return flows. We have a lot of animals. Animal numbers are increasing too all over the world because of protein needs. And if you come to time, you can see that um, it was slow and then we start to see um, in any of the indicators that we look at that we're seeing a great acceleration of numbers of animals. That means a, a lot more animal waste. Um, we are uh, cultivating our world. And subsequently, as we cultivate, we see a decrease in our natural systems that may be buffering our waters, which are our wetlands around the world. Um, these are some other data um, in terms of um, agriculture. This is cereals, which means that fertilizers, pesticides, manure, in some cases, biosolids are going onto our land. Uh, import exports, these are um, uh, pesticides. Um, and uh, uh, whatever you start to look at, except in a few instances, you start to see uh, at some point um, this great acceleration. So I'm going to contend to you that we have not kept up. And that while we're starting to talk about climate change in the, in the, the big scene, we should be talking about water quality um, in addition to water quantity um, as a global threat. Um, we know the economics of pollution, morbidity, mortality costs, outbreaks and disasters, productivity loss, educated workforce, water influences the educated workforce, um, quality of life, trends, boundary issues, so a lot of political blame games. And tourism, just if you look at one sector which is growing, and relies heavily on high water quality and these coastal systems, uh, you'll see that it's one of the highest growing sectors, 9.7% of the world GDP. But for some countries, tourism is actually a huge percentage of their GDP. That's their future economic growth. Um, it's not just the developed, developing world. The developed world may have serious uh, challenges for retrofitting their aging infrastructure. Um, and it's $390 billion estimated now to um, improve our infrastructure. So we're definitely having issues. Uh, the United States uh, infrastructure in water and wastewater is not getting a very good grade by the American Civil Engineering Society. And there's a lot of talk now about the blue economy. So uh, there's no better way to get politicians uh, you know, uh, I think attention than to say water is linked, pollution is linked to loss, and clean water is linked to growth of the economy. So the estimates of the, of the blue economy in various sectors are quite high, and this is just one report that has estimated this. I like to think about the biohealth of the planet to a certain extent, and I think water really is at the core of the biohealth. And I don't think it matters whether we're talking about humans or animals or plants. And I think that while we in this room focus on the human health side, I think this connection to the health of, of plants and aquatic plants and aquatic ecosystems and the health of, our, of our, um, our animal populations, whether you're talking about wildlife or domestic animals um, or agricultural based animals, is going to be important to our sustainability and security. So I really like to think that water is at the core of the biohealth of the planet. And I would still contend that fecal pollution, and in this case we're thinking about humans, is a, a major source of contamination to our water systems. 
We know we have a whole variety of infrastructure out there. It's all over the place. And it's really susceptible, as you can see from the, the picture of uh, both Katrina and I could put up the picture from Sandy that recently hit. Um, we could probably put up, put up some pictures from the UK um, impacting our, our own infrastructure as things flood. And I really appreciated the Monday session where there was a, a discussion about this flooding and disasters and linked to water quality. We also have old diseases that we think we've controlled through vaccinations, like poliovirus. And we have some emerging diseases that are showing up. Certainly, enterovirus 71, we thought, well, that's in Asia. No, it's not. We've got it in the United States. It's fecal oral, there's no doubt. There's some respiratory transmission. But this new enterovirus recently linked to cases of polio-like outcomes in children in California, I believe was identified as enterovirus 68. So environmental virology, we have a list of viruses. It's growing. We heard about Ocuvirus yesterday. We've got bacteriophages as indicators. And we also have uh, the phage ecologists. And so the world of virology is quite interesting because viruses need a host. And some viruses have this host specificity. So what, do we, what can we learn about looking at this, the world of viruses? The way we've done it in the past has restricted us because we've had to use cell culture, so it's only cultivation. Um, or, um, you know, so some, th some viruses don't, aren't culturable. And we don't know what they are. Um, we've gone now to genomics and PCR. But PCR, unless we can multiplex more successfully, um, and we, this is a sequence-dependent system because we must know the primers, um, limits us as well. So what I'm suggesting is that these new technologies offer us an opportunity for exploring this, the world of viruses that is so unknown to us um, and uh, sequence-independent and it gives you a whole genome. And um, I think that the new platforms are leading us to uh, interesting um, discussions and more science questions and, and better science in the future. So what I want to present is some of our projects, some of our preliminary data, and um, what's going on in this arena. Now, you know that the world is one big microbiome. <laughs> Uh, and this doesn't include even the microscopic eukaryotes. We could throw them up there too, but of course the prokaryotes and the suggestion that viruses are even more numerous by numbers than any of the other groups um, has been already um, uh, listed. And we have, it's estimated 99% are unknown. We don't know what they are. The um, new platforms that have evolved, of course, we're, we're starting back here uh, using indicator systems to measure water, go out and take a water sample. Um, but these other platforms have been developing and being used both in the clinical and medical discovery. Um, obviously, the discovery of DNA back in the 50s, the first sequencing system, Sanger. <laughs> I don't know how many rooms that took up the machine. <laughs> Um, of course, polymerase chain reaction in the 80s, microarray hybridization technology has helped us. The Human Genome Project, though, um, really started pushing um, companies to start building instrumentation to link uh, our ability sequence from these technologies and hybridize um, uh, to where we could do these type of sequencing in, in uh, faster, cheaper more data, right? The 454 came along, you know, in 2000, and then you see Illumina show up and a whole variety of Illumina-type machines, and then you've got machines that actually, and as I think we heard at one of the sessions yesterday, they can take a single cell and look at that genome, which is really interesting, fantastic. So what does that mean with the microbiome? Well, we, if, if we're going to apply these things to the environment, it's a little bit probably more complicated than some of the human microbiome studies, which are just taking uh, pretty large concentrations of organisms out of the gut. Um, we're looking at soils and waters and so solid matrix and liquid matrix and, ma and probably even air. So we have to collect that still. We have to concentrate it still. We have to purify it. 
we have to extract it to get that community DNA. If we're looking for RNA, which we're looking for RNA viruses, obviously, we're probably looking for RNA more than many of the other groups. We've got to transcribe that RNA to cDNA. And then we've got to get it into the sequencing. And then we finally got to do the analysis. So it's quite a lot of steps, and it's quite a lot to think about in terms of our traditional methods for sampling, both how we collect the samples and how we process the samples and then how we analyze the sample. So I think we have to think about the new, a, new way, a new way to assess the efficacy, the approaches, and that type of thing. So we see this as an intersection between the traditional environmental virology, the water safety, and the technology. We think genomes of all viruses that inhabit particular organisms um, in a, an environmental niche can be uh, evaluated with the next generation. And we think this might be a frontier for science and exploration. So let's see where it's taking us so far. We have started, and I noticed that EPA had done some wastewater. They mentioned that they were doing some wastewater analysis. Um, we're doing wastewater and water for the most part. Um, you saw, if you saw Sam's poster yesterday, um, uh, she's looking at irrigation waters and maybe some, some viromes off lettuce. But we want to look at uh, better assessment. We think viruses give us some resolution. Why? Because there's some host specificity there. Um, some fudge are not so host specific, but that's another story. Um, can we identify a whole new slew of new targets for characterization? Can this new database support new monitoring practices and transform the way we test for water quality? If you look at water, all water has a biome, microbiome. I don't care where you are, if you leave water in a glass, if you leave water in a bottle, in a pipe, anywhere there's water and there's an interface, there's going to be a microbiome. Wastewater is an interesting one because we know, already know through a whole variety of studies um, over the, since probably the 70s when they first started looking at, at poliovirus, that it harbors a large number of viruses with a wide range of genomes. So we've had um, a multidisciplinary team, public health microbiologists, virologists, but also people like Titus Brown, who specializes in bioinformatics, um, as well as some environmental engineers engaged in these projects. Um, we've got two major objectives to use metagenomics with the Illumina sequencing platform to generate a view of the viral biome. We're looking at wastewaters from various spots in the treatment plant, ballast waters. We've got a project now looking at water and commerce, and we're particularly interested in ballast waters, both freshwater ballast waters and marine ballast waters. And it's really exciting that our partners in this exploration, um, Karina Jin, who's here um, at NUS, and uh, looking at maybe ballast waters in Singapore. So that's going to be very exciting. And then um, as Sam's been working uh, on a grant with the USDA that's looking at the virome on both um, produce and uh, the environment um, that influences potentially that produce, which is irrigation waters. So we're just getting started on that one. Lots of lettuce to process there. <laughs> uh, but the second part is also equally important, um, and that is the use of the bioinformatics platforms or even new software that people are starting to develop to analyze the metagenomic uh, information, uh, to understand the viral ecology, so to speak, the characterize the water environ, um, and the virome, and the diversity. So can we understand what's healthy, what's not healthy, um, can we find out who's there and what's there? So here's a, just a brief uh, look at our methods. And um, you know we're, we've got uh, sample concentration with ultrafiltration. We're using ultrafiltration. Um, uh, we're pre-treating that. Um, we're trying to separate out the viruses from the cells uh, before extraction um, to get rid of any free nucleic acid, um, reverse transcription for RNA viruses, and Illumina sequencing. There's actually, we found a lot of positive controls because our early work showed there was contamination with bacterial 16S. Now, there's bacterial genes in your virome. Why? Because there's bacteriophage. But you don't want to have evidence that the bacterial genome itself is there, that it hasn't been picked up by the virus. So there's a lot of papers coming out about that quality control. So we've been looking at, can we get rid of the 16S, right? And then it goes into, of course, the comp computational methods. And there's a whole, um, both um, new methods that are looking at, at uh, analyzing 
Uh, the sequence is from a non-reference uh, perspective. In other words, you don't need a database to analyze your, your data or uh, the traditional way, which is blasting against a reference library. And I'd say, I'd have to say after uh, what Tiong has said that still the NCBI viral database is probably one of the, the better um, in terms of looking for virus sequences that are already known and up there. But there's some other ones coming along that um, may uh, serve us well. So here's the ultra filter. Some of you have used it, a pass through. We use the MWCO. Um, uh, and it's a single pass-through system. Um, we have, look, it's pretty inexpensive. We take it on site. Um, it does take a little bit longer to process the sample. So if you're looking at 100 liters. Um, oh, here's some data that's been looked at with a variety of FODs to look at recovery. We haven't done the human um, animal virus as yet for recovery, but other people have if you look in the literature. And so I think it's pretty good. We found that there are sticky viruses. So we've uh, developed a procedure that where we elute uh, what's been stuck to the membrane and we actually increase the recoveries, at least from, for the phage. Um, and so we've used this uh, procedure um, both for groundwater and surface waters. We're, we're starting to look at it, uh, the recovery, what, how does the matrix influence that recovery? We know that when we get to the wastewater, that recovery uh, can be different. These are some pictures of some of our wastewater sites at Orange County. We did some, if you know Orange County does has a big reclamation system, so we've been going from, they have two trains, one which is activated sludge, traditional activated sludge, other they actually have a train that's still trickling filter. So it's theoretically very different kinds of populations. They come together, they go through microfiltration, reverse osmosis, and then advanced treatment for um, their water reclamation. So we've been sampling along that treatment train. And this, these are just some pictures. I guess it would take about, it takes us anywhere about an hour and a half to do 100 liters um, through, this, uh, through this method. So it's a little bit more time. We are using the 2500 Illumina. The Illumina platforms are changing so fast that um, if you go to the literature, it was the 2000, then it was this, that, that, the other. And I think it's really critical. We work directly with our genome center because they rerun our samples for free because they are getting used to the machine, um, looking at the quality of the contigs, all these, there's, there's issues with the new technology and the new platforms that they're trying to figure out as well. And so if you were, I think at this stage, as scientists, we can work with them uh, to get replicates of our samples with different things because the, it's not just a straightforward technology um, when you put these samples in to be analyzed. Um, these are um, uh, uh, typically uh, small uh, 100 base pairs, which means that you need to assemble them. They have to be tagged so that you assemble them and put them into longer base pairs for analysis. And that's part of the quality control. Now this is just some examples. Of, of what we might get. Um, we get, uh, you know, 17 million. And in fact, uh, when they were redoing this, because this wasn't as high as they had anticipated with other samples. So that's why they were redoing our samples, because our context, it seemed like they were low compared to s other samples. But still 17 million <laughs> contexts. Uh, uh, clean reads, I should say, the total number of contexts, 31,000. As you, we started assembling these, this is the total length of the base pair once you assemble. And you really only have about 30% um, that develop into reads. So we have a lot of data that's not being used right now from this technology. Um, and uh, here is your longest uh, contig. And uh, average of seven, 750 base pairs is what you're blasting the database against. A pretty good size, but of course it's all about that assembly and the controls. And so you lose that as you start to assembly. And what they go through the, what they call the bioinformatics pipeline, you know, in terms of what software, this is all about software that is used. And I can tell you that these are all um, on the market, free to use. Um, and some universities are starting to have course, courses where the students can go and learn to use these programs with their own data sets. But um, people like Titus Brown are developing new programs because there's so much data there that has not been analyzed. So I, I suspect in the next few years, the bioinformatics part is going to change really dramatically. So let's see what we got. So I was really surprised when they actually brought the results because I was thinking, 
you know, I don't know, this is like, you know, um, are we really going to get, uh, be able to explore viruses in a single sample? Now, I'll have to say that our hypothesis was that every single sample was going to be different. And why? Because, first of all, we haven't done replicate space and time. We're going out and getting a single sample here, a single sample there. So just our sample collection might bias that. Secondly, we don't know anything about the diversity and the unknowns. And so what we might get, so our null hypothesis was that every single sample we analyze is going to produce some kind of different, you know, set of virums. You know, even if we took a replicate sample. So that was, that's where our starting hypothesis is. And I'm going to show you some data on what we, what we found. But not surprising, and this has been found with 454. Uh, there's been some other work done with other Illumina platforms and 454. 77% uh, no hits. So we have a huge amount of data that we're not able to analyze um, against a reference database, any of the reference databases. So this is where Titus is starting to look um, and analyze this. If we can analyze what is assigned and he can analyze what's not assigned, do we get the same answer as we start to explore these environments? What are we losing for, you know, are these unique viruses um, that are not in the database and the ones that are in the debate, database are everywhere? So one of our hypotheses could also be we could disprove our null hypothesis and that every sample is the same because what we know and what's in the database links up and we're only analyzing that piece of the pie. So we can have it, have it both ways. We weren't sure how it was going to go. But when we look then um, into what we do know, what we can assign, we've got a large percentage of double-stranded DNA virus and single-stranded DNA viruses, small percentage of single-stranded RNA viruses, unclassified, um, so they, they match things in the virus database, but you can't classify them, and, and some satellites, uh, things that would match um, uh, you know, the, uh, some of the bacterial data and things like that. And we can actually assign these. So a large percentage, and this has also been shown before, 67% are bacteriophage. 10% um, are plant viruses. Now remember, this is sewage. So are the plant viruses coming through our, our food, um, or are, do we have leaky sewers? We, you know, um, and we also have animal viruses. These are not human. These are in the animal uh, kingdom um, uh, and um, uh, away from humans. And then we've got, we can find the human viruses which is different than the 454. If you look at the original publications on 454, they couldn't go deep enough to find the lower percentage viruses. So in fact, I think in, in one of the studies, they couldn't find any human viruses in the virome that they looked at. And it's probably the abundance, you know, in relationship to all these other things. Um, not surprising, this bacteriophage are in the Cotovirales uh, group which is our uh, colophage group is in there, right? Um, but it's also really interesting the number of different bacterial hosts that are listed. There's three, there's three I guess they call them genera, that are in this group. And in that group, um, you know, you're talking about, uh, in one group, 200 different strains. If you go to uh, some of the, and start to explore the, the virology and the nomenclature, the taxonomy in these groups, so one group has 100, and, and some of it's uh, anaerobic organisms, streptococci, it's all over. So we don't know very much about these phage and their hosts from this sequencing. It's quite interesting, the diversity of bacterial hosts that is represented in this big pie, piece of the pie. Um, and uh, exploring that host phage you know, uh, linkage, I think, is really interesting. Now, and that was the original idea of phage ecology. And in fact, they're trying to use phage again for managing, you know, activated sludge, managing human health, and all kinds of things. They're trying to re-explore the use of phage. But we don't know very much about these hosts and their, and their viruses. We also have another group of uh, phage, the microviridae. We have the insect viruses, um, unclassified phage, and the cordoviridae. So really interesting uh, that I think that while we've, in the public health water microbiology, we kind of restricted ourselves uh, to colophage for a long time. We're now starting to use maybe an enterococci phage. Bacteroides phage has also been used. 
we're not even at the tip of what the fodge population is in the wastewater environment. What is going on out there? It's really interesting, and we really need a lot more people educated in doing research in fodge, in the bacteria fodge, in the natural environment, and especially in these environments that are influenced by the Anthropocene, by humans, by human inputs or animal inputs. So you can go with Illumina all the way down in these big reeds. So you can start to get identification. You can get prevalence or, I guess, abundance, relative abundance in your sample. So the bigger the circle here, the, the greater the abundance. And that reflects that pie chart I showed you before, right? So here's some of the, the myoviridae, the potoviridae, and the cifoviridae. The myoviridae are where the colophage uh, pr predominantly are. Um, we also see this poxviridae, which we think is in animals. We're not really sure. Um, you're not always sure about the... Um, uh, similarity. Some in when you do these blast searches, you get very high similarity, like 99%, so you feel confident. But others, you're probably getting, you know, 95, 92% similarity. And you, as you know, with virus genomes, you start getting to that, you know, it sounds like it's a high similarity, but with virus genomes, you get to the lower similarities. You're not as confident about that identification. Um, these single stranded DNA viruses are showing up which I find very interesting because I think that we have not explored the single-stranded DNA viruses very well. And they're showing up in the fudge and they're showing up in the animal virus group. And when I first saw this circle viridae, I was like, I don't know what the circle viridae really are. And I started exploring that. And here, here you can see, and, and I was actually very pleased to see that the human viruses showing up match some of the qPCR. And I can tell you people that are saying, well, we, we've got to go back and quality control this. The way they contr quality control, they go back to the sample and they do use qPCR or just PCR to reanalyze the sample to see are they getting the same answer for certain viruses. So that is the way right now they're doing some verification of samples of this database. Obviously, you would have to choose which viruses and how many PCRs you wanted to run. But at any rate, so I was happy when the, the human viruses came out. Um, I thought it was interesting that some adenoviruses that we don't really think about are showing up. Um, you know, we think about the 41, you know, it shows up in, in F, but uh, these other adenoviruses, maybe we're missing some things. Um, and so I, I went and looked at this Circa Veridae. Um, oh, wait, before I get to that. This was the comparison. So this was interesting. So they did a, 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 a Tiong did a principal components analysis. This is one based just on the known sequences for now. And we're analyzing the unknown sequences with a new program to see if it matches up the same. So, we, so was our hypothesis right that each sample is going to be quite distinct? Um, and, um, uh, you know, or was our hypothesis wrong? So what we found was actually there was a clustering between the untreated sewage coming into the plant, the activated sludge, and the trickling filter. Now, we actually thought the trickling filter and activated sludge would be quite different, that we wouldn't be able to group them. Um, now, this is grouped by both similarity of sequences and abundance. So both of those are the components that are used. Um, but the microfiltration, so after microfiltration, that's very different. It stands out. So the viruses that are getting through the microfiltration are quite different. And check, I think you'll be interested in this, what we found. Um, getting through microfiltration was the um, toba, toba, ma, toba ma, mara. How do we say that, Mark? <laughs> viruses. You know, the, so the, the mosaic viruses, the tobacco, includes the pepper uh, virus that people are saying have are, is quite robust. Why it's robust, I don't know. But what, and it's getting through microfiltration, and maybe it's less sticky or something. I don't know, because we know microfiltration is probably the mechanism for removal of viruses is different than an RO. But um, so these viruses are getting through, um, and the pepper mild um, uh, multivirus is being detected in these microfiltration effluents. Um, so, but we don't know what, what concentration. We know relative abundance, but this is not quantitative. So we'd have to go back and maybe do some qPCR. So these are some of the viruses. And as I said, this circle viridae showed up. And 
I was looking at it, avian and swine viruses, that's where it is. And so I started doing more exploration and I ran across these studies. And in fact, there's another study now that is looking at genome comparison using traditional methods and some isolates from the United States in comparison to isolates from humans, from pigs. And they're finding that this pig virus has sequence homology to what's showing up uh, in the children. And of course, we have not necessarily seen this cyclovirus, as far as I know, uh, show up in children in the United States. Um, and it's been showing up in children. And it's this tiny, I mean, it's a tiny virus. It's one of the smallest viruses. It's smaller than the Picornaviridae. And it's a single-stranded DNA. So it's this tiny, tiny little virus. We know nothing about its persistence, transport, resistance to chlorine, resistance to UV. It's quite interesting. You can grow some of the Circoviridae. Um, they're, they're, they're not easy to grow. I've been talking to some of the vet med people. And as you may have heard, there's a, uh, another circo, uh, virus in the Circoviridae family. I think it's just called pig diarrheal virus. Who was I talking to that about? Stephanie, I think. I don't know if Stephanie's still here. But um, um, it's causing diarrheal deaths around the United States right now in pigs, this other um, virus in the Circoviridae family. So interesting. I mean, I would have never looked at this if I hadn't seen this database. Now, our ballast water uh, work is really, really uh, interesting. And are we running out of time? No. It was, it was 8.30 to 9.30. Okay, good. I was, I was like, oh, did we start at 8 or when did we start? I forgot to look at my watch. Okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to wind up then and I'll have time for, for discussion and Q&A. So the ballast water stuff came about in a water and commerce. And, and you may know that the, the International Maritime Organization has, has been trying to look at ballast water regulations. The estimates, I mean, they're huge estimates. So actually, there's some studies where they use the microscopy method to look at virus-like particles in ballast waters, right? And they're finding 10 to the 9th, 10 to the 17th. This is set 9th per liter, 10 to the 17th per ship of virus-like particles in this ballast water. And we don't have any idea. That's under the microscope, right? That method where you stain it and count them up. Um, the IMO has some rules and regulations. It's estimated that both animals, plants, and invasive, the invasive species is associated with these ballast waters moving around. Of course, Vibrio cholera was associated with from the human side. But um, fish virus, we've got a fish virus in the Great Lakes suggested it came in with ballast waters, and it's from Asia originally. So um, there's a lot of interest right now in the interim. The rules are that you have to discharge in the middle of the ocean and pick up clean stuff before you come into port. So you have to be 200 nautical, nautical, nautical miles out, and you have to be even further out um, in some ports. And you have to exchange there, put up uh, clean ballast waters from the ocean so that when you're in port and you're loading and unloading and you're discharging your ballast water, what you're discharging is supposedly clean water from the middle of the ocean. Uh, as long as you're not near like uh, the plastic island, which has all the tiny little plastics with PCBs and biofilms, <laughs> you know, you're not picking those up. And uh, now, in the United States, we have a ballast rule that just came on board. So this, this rule, this is the link between policy and what we do. Because this ch change in policy now allows the state agencies to go on the ship. And I can tell you, before this policy was instigated, people that were trying to do ballast water studies had a very difficult time. You had to get permission of the ship owner. And more than likely, you did not get permission to go on the ship and get the samples. And now, with the rules and policy, we can go on the ship with the state agency. And in fact, in California, we went out to Long Beach. We don't have the marine data right now. We just started analyzing that. Um, but um, the, uh, we got on every ship that we wanted to get on through the state agency. They knew where the ships were coming from. They knew their logs. They knew when they had exchanged, supposedly. So all that information is now because of the policy. California is somewhat leading the way. And I don't know how that's going to influ influence the global commerce routes. But, uh, and I'll be going out there again to work with the, the, the group. But they want um, non-viable discharge. 
no viable organisms in ballast waters. That's one of their stated goals. They're also writing a virus standard, but they have no idea what that means. Because <laughs> I asked them, I was like, you have a virus standard, huh? Well, interesting. So all the ships that are coming into California are going to have, it's going to be on-site treatment. I read in World Water News, this is a $500 billion market in the next two years in water treatment. It's huge. And what's the water quality goal? It's, it's, so, at any rate, okay, enough of that. Data. So I'm going to show you our preliminary data. We, we sampled in the Great Lakes. The Great Lakes are part of NOAA and the coastal system, even though they're fresh, partly because, as you know, we have big ships, not in the winter. Um, I think they just opened up the route again. We still have ice, ice cover from this year. Um, but so we have ships come in and, and go through, and in, particularly in Lake Superior, where we have some national parks, some national shorelines, invasive species has been a very big issue up there in terms of ballast waters, ballast exchange. Um, and so, and that's one of the bigger ports is up there in Duluth. Um, and so um, we went up to sample in Duluth. We took from the harbor and the water next to the ship and the water in the ballast tank, right? And these are the ways you kind of get them. There is a sounding pipe in some cases. Now, so we had all these carboys we were filling up. Actually, so we got a new uh, SOP because uh, we, uh, the ship uh, personnel figured out that we would lower these big carboys <laughs> after we filled them up over the side instead of trying to climb down the gangplank <laughs> you know, with these stupid things and usually rolling down the gangplank. Um, and so now we've got in our SOP where you, you'd have to take the rope where you can <laughs> you lower it over the side, you know, to get it down. Uh, it's heavy, right? And we usually set up in a, um, in a nearby lab. We try to find a collaborator and set up to do the analysis right that day so we collect and then go do the uh, concentrations. Um, and so we knew where these ships had picked up the water. Um, we sampled um, the harbor and the ship. So we might have a hypothesis that whatever we sample in the ballast water, because they're discharging right there, right at the, at the harbor, is going to be the same as in the harbor. So we paired them. So let's take a look at this data. And, and one of the interesting things, um, again, is that um, in this case, uh, the data was not only analyzed by genomics, but by function. So you can actually go into the viral functional databases, and you can say what are the, you know, how does the DNA match, what, what kind of uh, functions are going on with viruses. Is it uh, DNA, you know, DNA replication, really? Uh, virulence, what they're calling virulence factors are probably these uh, attachment factors and other things. Um, those should, I think we should define those better because virulence m makes you think of some of the genes in bacteria and maybe we need to make sure that we're defining what we mean by virulence in viruses because all <laughs> viruses are parasitic, by the way, so they, I don't know. Um, regulating and other. And, um, and so this is the harbor water and this is the ballast water by uh, taxonomy and by um, function. They don't really look different. Interesting here in this database, the algal viruses, these are eukaryotic, by the, by the way, these are viruses that affect the eukaryotic algae, not the blue-greens. And you can find the blue, some of the blue-green algae. But these phycovirodae, phyco, um, phyco these are uh, uh, eukaryotic algae viruses. So they're showing up a little bit more in the harbor than in the uh, ballast water, uh, potentially. Uh, but it looks, it looks pretty similar, maybe a little bit different. But then when we get to the uh, principal components analysis, what we're actually finding is that our paired samples are distinct. So we do have, every, everywhere there's an H, there's a harbor. So we do have this one weird harbor sample. We haven't investigated why. You know, so we, we just started the analysis, so we need to go back and say, what is making this harbor water different from these? So they clustered. Um, and we've got one ballast water in that cluster, but our, um, our paired ballast IB and IH are very different from each other. So our hypothesis that they were going to be similar, or maybe our hypothesis that they would be very different. So both are wrong, right? <laughs> we, we you know, because we do have similarity. And then we have these differences. So now we need to go and explore 
what is what what uh, virus gene sequences or is it abundance what is it that's uh, that's uh, causing these differences one thing quite interesting if you look at the fresh lake data set and we blast this against other data sets other virome data sets that are in the literature um, there's others that you can find where they've used um, Illumina platforms. You can show that they, are, they match closer to other freshwater uh, viromes, um, but they are somewhat distinct, but they're very distinct from the saline. So it'll be quite interesting to see what happens in Singapore when we start looking at more saline and, and, and maybe compare that to Long Beach. I wonder if Long Beach and Singapore will be the same or different. be interesting. So there's a huge amount of technical challenges with this new um, uh, technology. But I find it fascinating in exploring viruses. It's just opened my eyes. I've studied environmental virology since the get-go. That was what I started in. And I really find this new technology just fascinating in terms of exploration of viruses in our water environment. But there's big challenges that we need to maybe address. Um, and some of them are experimental. I mean, they're the same old, same old. But maybe we've addressed them a little bit with our old technology. But some of them are just sampling. What are we going to do about sampling in time and space? And these large volumes and getting a, oh, the big deal with ballast water is representative samples. Are you going to, I don't know, you open up a hatch and we're bucketing out 100 liters of water out of this big tank. I have no clue, it, you know. Um, New and better tools for recovery and purification of viruses is ultrafiltration, I think, is a really good uh, system for us capturing everything there, and we can start to separate things out. So I really like that system. It's a little bit cumbersome, and it's a little bit time-consuming. It's not actually expensive. It's expensive in time. Um, and, but I think it's extraction. I still don't think that we, we may be biasing things by extraction. We don't know very much about extraction and efficiency, extraction from different matrices. And most of the time when we look at efficiency loss or DNA losses, it always happens in extraction. So, I, you know, you're balancing between recovery and purification, right? So how do we, how do we get a better balance there? Because I don't know if we're there yet. Um, the computational methods are very exciting and the visualization tools. But we're the, I, I think the bioinformatics people are at the very start of trying to explore the virome where they've had a lot of experience with bacterial genomes, human genome, but the virome, even in clinical samples, I think we're just at the very start. So we're going to see new pipelines, new, you know, and how do we um, take our data sets, put them someplace where the community can use them as they b develop new tools, um, these new software tools. And then how are we going to address these unknown sequences? What are the, all these sequences in there? I mean. It's just, um, it's just interesting. There's all these viruses. We don't know what they are. We don't know if they're causing health risks to animals, plants, humans. They're just bacteriophage. What are they? Um, it's uh, going to be uh, a, a great area for the new scientists to, environmental scientists to explore. So our research needs, I think, and this is my, this is my last slide, um, characterization of viruses in the water environment. I think we can use this te technology to really start to characterize things more than we could ever do before. We, we, cannot, do it with Q we cannot do it in the same way with qPCR. Um, we cannot do it in the same way with hybridization. We cannot do it in the same way with cultivation. Um, we're going to have to start looking at this water treatment. This is fascinating, the, the, and the mechanisms around water treatment and what's going on. Um, experimental approaches, um, the Illumina sequencing, that is changing. Um, and then we're going to have to look at how do we start uh, to validate the traditional way, as I said, is to go back to your samples, choose some sequences, choose some viruses, and use qPCR to go back to those same samples and try to verify that those viruses are in your sample. So there's some verification issues with this big, big data, and then you're spot checking, kind of trying to verify certain things. Um, but so far, I've been like really surprised when we start to sit down and we start looking at what, what the information is, is um, after all these steps and all these things, uh, what the information is providing us. I want to acknowledge our funding. We've been funded by the National Science Foundation, Partnership for International Research and Education, um, and our, our colleagues um, who are doing the, the ballast water inspection. Um, in California and Wisconsin, and we're still working with them. Um, 
the wastewater utilities uh, East Lansing and Orange County, uh, Shannon Rock and Kirk Nolte uh, were just, uh, and Shannon didn't come, huh? I thought Shannon was going to be here. Oh, well. Anyway, they helped us uh, run around Yuma, Arizona and sample uh, irrigation water. So uh, next year, Sam will have lots more information about irrigation waters and, and the virome on lettuce. <laughs> And, of course, the support of MSU has been um, just instrumental, and Titus Brown, who's our bio, who's an um, expert in bioinformatics. So thank you very much for inviting me here. Uh, I was excited, and, and Tiong was uh, uh, gracious enough to help me put this presentation together and explain some of it to me. <laughs> so I'm learning, I'm still learning about uh, new technology for studying viruses in water, which is always great after all those years since my very first publication on, or my first presentation on viruses in water, right, some 30 years ago. So thanks very much. Thank you very much, Joan, for a, uh, an inspirational and uh, exciting and I hope very uh, motivating presentation to an audience of uh, uh, many young people who I hope will realize that there is a great future in environmental virology, especially with the new tools and the new challenges that you've uh, pointed out. So um, if you would, um, the presentation is open for, for questions and comments, and if you have them, please come to the microphones and let us know who you are and your affiliation, um, and uh, we'll, we'll ask Joan to... Uh, uh, to uh, give us some more of, uh, feedback on your questions and comments. So I'm uh, Scott Keeley at the EPA, and uh, I have a proposal that you try to also, for a research need, look at virus particles individually and sequence them to get uh, environmental references for, you know, we don't necessarily know what they are in terms of their genes, but we can have the context complete. That's a, a big challenge, but that would be useful. Or what do you think about that, at least? Yeah, I'll, I'll have to get with you to see how to grab an individual viron that has a nucleic acid in it out of a water sample. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, I mean, whether it's, whether it's fluidics or facts or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Hi, uh, Matt Verbila from University of South Florida. Um, I really thought one part that was really striking was the similarity between activated sludge and um, trickling filters. And I know in a lot of different areas in Europe and in some areas in Latin America, there, there's a push for anaerobic wastewater treatment. And I'm wondering if anyone has looked at um, the virome in these anaerobic wastewater treatment technologies. I, there's some virome and biosolids data out there, but I don't think coming directly out of the anaerobic digesters, you know, in terms of, and it's, and, um, you know, maybe even contrasting the animal waste side because there's a lot more anaerobic digesters in animal waste than there is human waste. But it would be quite, yeah, it'd be quite interesting, I think, to look at um, because that's, that should be a very different environment. Yeah, that's a good idea. Thank you. There's a lot of different, um, uh, I think, environments to explore. So biosolids, but not anaerobic digesters that I know of. I don't know of any Yeah, Chuck Kerba. Hey, Joan, I noticed the one thing that was missing was the double-stranded RNA viruses, which, you know, like real viruses, if you do viability, they seem to be the most abundant. Does that just not show up or they weren't there or the methodology just doesn't detect those? You know, it could be that, um, you know, the the proceed, and I think it's a process. My view is it's process because um, when we do, you have to do the, right, the cDNA. But first, with a, with a double-stranded RNA, we have to make sure that it's getting separated. And I'm not sure that anybody's actually done an experimental control. So we had been talking about could we uh, at least get up to uh, uh, and just use PCR or something like that to explore the, the pathway, the pipeline, to see whether we're losing the double-stranded RNA. Now, in the past studies, and this is something that we're doing differently, too, is that we're doing everything in the same sample. But in the past studies, what they've done is split the samples. They've done the RNA viruses over in this and then run them on the um, sequencer. And then they've done the DNA viruses here. We're doing it all in one soup. So we're now 
looking at those, but the double-stranded RNA viruses don't show up in this uh, database, uh, and you're quite right, and we think it is a methods issue. My next question is, the, a, if nobody else has one, um, is the uh, finding the pepper virus and related Toma viruses coming through the ultra filter, those are large viruses. You're talking 300 nanometers in length, maybe only 18 nanometers in depth, but it's kind of surprising why that virus Well, penetrates. microfiltration is pretty big pore size. It yeah. doesn't remove viruses, but well, that it was removes them by absorption. Okay, that was ultra filtration or micro? micro oh, filtration. micro, okay. okay. Micro filtration. That's still interesting because in our studies on uh, transported viruses in groundwater, it's those viruses that show up traveling the furthest, and yet they're one of the larger viruses. But maybe the pore sizes are yeah. large. Well, yeah. maybe it's going through little leaks that they don't know about. Yeah. I don't know what the mechanism is, but uh, yeah, it's interesting. Um, I guess I will take the uh, liberty of asking a question uh, myself, Joan. I was very struck by the uh, relative abundance of the microviridae, and um, and and that's because in some of my own work, I have found them to be uh, amongst the most abundant viruses in in sewage, and actually very persistent uh, in the environment compared to some of the other bacteriophages. And I guess my question has to do with uh, what do we know about the host variability or the host uh, differences for these. I mean I, I mean, I only know about the coliphage microviridae, but perhaps there are a lot more microviridae of a lot of other different they bacterial do have hosts. A, yeah. And therefore, we're now faced with this dilemma of trying to maybe sort through them and understand who they are, where they come from, how they're different, how they're related. And I do think the taxonomy in these, in, in certain groups, we should explore because if you go and, and you look, and you start to delve down, um, you find a whole series of different bacterial hosts. And I, I did have a slide, I didn't use it here, but um, uh, Easel's done some analysis and she, she put up how many of the bacterial hosts, so this list of different bacterial hosts that could possibly be with these different viruses. And it, it's a pretty long list. And I don't think we know anything about the promiscuity in one case in, and how much uh, bacterial DNA some of these may be picking up and spreading around. And uh, just there's just a whole slew of questions with this group. But they show up in almost all our data sets, that microviridae family. Okay. Any Long list of bacterial else. Any other comments or, or questions for, for Joan? Oh. Huh? That's a different Good timing. Kind of That's break time. All right. <laughs> so, uh, if not, um, again, thank you so much, Joan, for you. a wonderful presentation. <laughs> and um, the rest of the uh, afternoon's uh, activities oh, will right. proceed very quickly. It's cool so, stuff. Thank you again for.